Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our first Clubhouse event, where we will be talking about the Handbook for New Stoics and using this as a guide and a journal for us to not only learn about Stoicism, but also implement it in our lives. This is something that we're going to be doing on a weekly basis. We're also going to be conducting Zoom calls once a month where we recap what we go over on Clubhouse so that we can invite new visitors to experience this process with us and also cover any information that our members might miss. We have a Patreon community that you can join in order to be part of our Clubhouse events that we will be holding once a week at this same time and date. It's on Thursdays at 8 a.m. Mountain, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. The first thing we want to do here is explain what Stoicism is and help you understand why we're so passionate about sharing this with women. The word Stoic, a lot of times the definition of it can be misunderstood. People think it means you're not supposed to express your feelings, and that's not exactly what this means in this context. This community is called Stoic Sister Society, and Stoic actually has been derived from the Greek word stoa, and stoa is essentially a porch, a general place where people would congregate to talk about philosophical ideas. And so that's really the foundation of what this is. And so if you're wondering what Stoicism is, it's essentially a philosophy, and it's founded on four main principles, justice, courage, wisdom, and temperance or moderation. And that's what we will be discussing throughout as we go through the handbook. And in today's meeting, we're going to be addressing week one of the handbook that I talked about. And week one covers the dichotomy of control. So we're going to be talking about the things that we can and cannot control. So Andrea, the co-founder of our group, is with us, and she's going to share the quote in this book right now from Epictetus. Thank you, Marissa, so much. I just want to add one thing to your intro there that I pulled out of the handbook here for Stoics that we're using as our guide that I thought was very powerful. And it says, Stoicism is roughly one part theory and nine parts practice. Epictetus said, if you didn't learn these things in order to demonstrate them in practice, what did you learn them for? Isn't that neat? Yeah, we can talk about this all day. And I think the reason why you and I are so passionate about doing this is because it's an activity. It's a process. It's something that we can implement ongoing and start to really understand how to apply the principles. Because even if we understand those principles, if we're not using it in our day-to-day lives, then it's not really going to benefit us. Exactly. So to the quote for week one, of all existing things, some are in our power and others are not in our power. In our power are thought impulse, will to get, and will to avoid, and in a word, everything which is our own doing. Things not in our power include body, property, reputation, office, and in a word, everything which is not our own doing. Epictetus. Today is really about understanding the difference between the things that we deal with and what we can control versus the things that are outside of that control. Oftentimes we focus on the things that are not in our control and then we get frustrated. And if we do that, then we feel like we fail, that things are not working. And it's really about understanding what you can do and not really waste any energy on the things that you just simply cannot control. Or that you have the incomplete control, right? Yes. For example, you could have control of what you eat so that you eat healthy foods, but you still can't control if your body is going to react badly to something or if you're going to get sick or something happens. That's something you just can't do anything about, but you can control what you're doing to help your body not get into that space. And I'm glad you used that as an example, because that was one of the 
eye openers for me in this lesson was, and I have to admit, I didn't ever give it a lot of thought, but it always kind of assumed that I had control over my body. And I think I was getting that confused with over my actions. Like I can control where my body moves, but I had confused that. And I think a lot of our suffering as humans comes from our bodies, maintaining these bodies and getting these bodies to do what we think that they should do. But for me, I could see how there might be a lot of liberation and just accepting the body. If we're just going to focus just on the body for a second here, just accepting the body. It is what it is at that moment in time. I suffer from migraines on occasion. And the difficult part beyond the pain for me is that I can't do the things I want to be doing. But no matter how hard I try, I can't will the migraine away. It has to run its course. Exactly. And I go through the exact same thing. I have migraines too. And it's very frustrating because you really can't function, especially when it just shows up. All of a sudden, it starts to hit you and you're wondering, what did I do? And you can't back it up. And then I would say, if I were going in order of perhaps grief, the second thing that was also interesting to me was not being able to control property. We're always set back time-wise, financially. There's probably other considerations when our property doesn't behave. (laughs) When something breaks, think about our car. If your car doesn't do what you are expecting it to do, that's really frustrating. Absolutely. And something is always breaking. We spend our times frustrated. We wake up assuming that everything's going to work. And then when it doesn't, we get upset and then we start to worry. And instead of worrying, we should start to identify, okay, well, this was inevitable. It's just a matter of time. And now we're here. So what can I do? And that's so liberating. Instead of hashing through all the things that were out of your control, or inevitable, like you said, just identify what you can actually take action on. So you can get the car fixed or the dishwasher replaced or whatever has to happen so you can be back to a high level of function. Yeah. And it's so funny, Andrea, that you use that as an example, because that's exactly what happened to me on Monday. (laughs) Believe it or not, our refrigerator is 25 years old. Wow. And finally, it's starting to give in. And the question then we had to ask was, do we try to fix it, but then will something else break? When you fix one thing, something else might give out versus saying, okay, I think it's time. We had to go through these questions in our heads and try and figure that out. And so I made a little list, for example, using the little sheet that they gave us in this handbook. And you put the name of the event and you put in what is in your complete control versus what's in complete control. So for example, I wrote down that the price that I want to spend on the new refrigerator is in my control, but the availability of that refrigerator is not within my control. Because I don't know if you're aware, but there's a lot of stock issues going on with appliances. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of times where you find something that you think you you like, and then it's not available and you need something that's not going to take three months to get, because I don't know if my refrigerator will last another three months. And then what's within my control is I can research. I can go online and I can look at what's there and what's available. But based on those reviews, I have to trust what I'm seeing. So I don't know if the actual refrigerator that I get is going to be reliable because I'm just basing it on the reviews that I'm reading, but you could get a lemon. Something could happen that makes it where you got five-star reviews and you're particular unit did not work out. So you can't control those things and you can't worry about that. You can just go by what you know from the research. And then you can also control where you buy it from, but you can't control the salesperson's behavior in whatever place you go to. Because I went to several places and some of them were very nice and some of them were not. And the other thing is you can control which brand or model you're going to get, but you can't control how many options of those things are available or out there. There might only be one type of refrigerator with the specs that you're looking for, not five. And so that's not within your control. The exercise really helped me 
list all the things that I can do and act on them. And it just made it very clear for me. So that little exercise was so helpful. So I'm glad you brought that up because I just happened to deal with it this week. And I did too, but it was the lawnmower. Oh my goodness. So I had a different experience because I wasn't interested in even researching which lawnmower to replace it with. I just needed a lawnmower that would cut the little bit of grass I have and that I could maintain because we had a 15-year-old gas mower that was ridiculously loud and I personally had no prior knowledge of the maintenance that had been done on it. So to me, I felt I might have contributed to it breaking because I have no lawnmower user experience or training. There's no manual. Like I was just winging it with the lawnmower and it it died when I was using it. So I was trying to use this to find a way to not feel bad for breaking the lawnmower and having to replace it, but to justify the actual new purchase of the lawnmower and then define exactly what I need this to do. So I was more interested in just getting my system back in place. And so I used it a little bit differently and in a sense to make myself feel better. And some of the things that I identified that were not in my control that helped me feel better was the age of the mower was not in my control. It was 15 years old. I mean, anybody could have been using it and it was its last mow. (laughs) I had no idea what the prior maintenance was on it, right? Like oil changes or if it had some kind of quirks about it. I also had no control that there wasn't someone who had any interest in helping me troubleshoot the lawnmower, right? So once I accepted that, that these things are just out of my control, then I went to, okay, what's in my control? I need to replace this obviously at a price that I can afford. And I knew that it was important that whatever I choose be something that I could understand how to maintain. So I went with battery power, push start. So with my level of understanding of motors, I know if the battery's charged, this thing is going to cut my grass. Exactly. And it's funny you say that because that's my lawnmower too. I did the same thing because we had a gas one and I was frustrated because I couldn't get it to start. Every time I'd pull it, it would jerk the wrong way and I just couldn't get it to work. And then like you said, maintaining it, putting gas in it and all those details discouraged me. So rather than dwell on that, I did exactly what you did. I decided I'm going to find a unit that fits my needs and I got a battery one with a push button (laughs) and now I enjoy the process. And every Saturday when I mow the lawn, I don't have to think twice about it. I just put the battery on and off I go. And when I used it the first time, I'm like, this is exactly like vacuuming the house. Yes. I can't believe how easy this is. And then For a brief moment, I felt completely foolish using such a loud, obnoxious lawnmower before this. Yeah, (laughs) it's so quiet and it is. And it's therapeutic now because you're absolutely right. I never even thought to describe it the way you did. It's like vacuuming the outside of your house and Mm -hmm. I get to use the time to work on my mind. So as my body is moving and it gives me a little workout because it takes me about an hour to do it, I'm also listening to audiobooks or podcasts or something so that my mind is also being stimulated. It's an absolutely wonderful experience that I actually look forward to now. (laughs) Yeah. Very neat. (laughs) So we were going to go over the review questions at the end of this unit and get some input on how we benefited or didn't benefit Mm -hmm. from these exercises. So I started my week reflecting on Sunday. So I did the reflection for Sunday on Monday morning. So I'm only at Thursday for this week. So I'll be reflecting on the four days of completing the exercises. Did you start sooner so you got through the full week? I started Monday and the way I'm doing it is I start Monday, then I have Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, they give you the little exercise sheet. So I fill those three days and then I'm going to do today after this meeting and then I'll just keep going until Monday. 
So we're at the same spot. Mm -hmm. It's just I'm reflecting on the day prior. Yeah. Is that what you're doing as well? Are you going to reflect on today or yesterday? I started right off the gate on Monday. What I did on Sunday was I read the book, the whole part for week one, just to recap because I already read it before, but I wanted to recap and make sure that I understood exactly what the exercises were. And then on Monday, I started. Okay. So I did the same. So that's good. So we're about at the same point in this process. The first question that the author poses to us is, was this week's exercise useful to you? Do you think it was useful to you, Marissa? I personally feel it was because I don't journal like you do. And so this is new to me. And it forced me to really think, not that I don't have the general predisposition to do this on my own without necessarily journaling, meaning I practice this naturally. It's just how I always think anyway. I'm always looking at, okay, what can I do versus what I can't do? It's just different verbiage. But it did help to put it down on paper. Somehow, when you look at it from this little column and you can kind of see what you're doing versus the things that you shouldn't have to be dwelling on, it just makes it more concrete and it just makes it a little more real. So I found it very, very helpful. And I did too. And I would say that I did not think like this. I think I put people's feelings and emotions ahead of the logic, if you will. And so to me, it was really empowering to instead kind of hit pause. For me, it gives that space between the immediate emotion and reality. This identifying what am I really responsible for in this situation instead of trying to take ownership for everything. So to me, it was really, really useful, very empowering, and I am excited to continue practicing this. This would be something that I think I would have to practice for an extended period of time before I felt like I thought like that. Yeah. And it's interesting you say that because we are very different. And yeah, this is exactly how I think about everything. So I think when we had the conversation about stoicism, one of the things that got me excited was I couldn't understand why I thought a certain way because I don't find a lot of other people that think the way I do. And when I stumbled across this philosophy, I finally found a home. I was like, this is exactly how I think. Oh my goodness. You know, and that was really eye-opening. But what I didn't do was I didn't put it down. And I know you're a big journaling person. You like to reflect and write things down. I don't do anything like that. So this got me in that space where I'm literally looking at the paper that I wrote down and I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't remember that all these things happened. And these are all the things that I did versus the things that I had absolutely zero control over. And it just allows you to see it on paper versus in a jumble in your mind. So that was the main difference for me. And for you, you're saying this is actually a practice that you're going to need to get into the habit of doing because it's not the way you were normally thinking, right? And I could definitely feel the actual benefits of not reacting immediately, that there was not a need to react And I guess in truth, there are very few situations that would require an immediate reaction. Outside of an emergency, you could almost always hit pause. On the second question there, what did you discover about yourself or your world? My kind of epiphany happened yesterday. And I caught myself three or four times yesterday noticing how quiet it is. And that thought just kept popping in my head. Gosh, it's so quiet. It's so quiet. What's going on? What it was, it was that my thoughts were not going crazy. And it truly was quiet for me. (laughs) Yeah, because this teaches you not to add more to your plate in your mind, because that's what happens, right? Yes. So that to me really is amazing. And I'm so grateful for that because I honestly don't know the last time I thought it was quiet. That's a really wonderful observation. 
my head is usually quiet outside of, I'm a very curious person. So I'm always thinking when I see something, I'm like, what about that? I'm always asking why. And that curiosity is more what gets me thinking so much that my brain is reacting, but not emotionally. So my brain works very much like this. I'm always going pros and cons. What can I do? What can't I do? And very rational. But I would say to your question there, what was my takeaway? I would say for me, even though a lot of these practices are things I've been doing, it helps to be reminded. And that is when you get a message from somebody and maybe it's not what you expected, wait, think, don't react. There's no reason to all of a sudden start typing away and answering immediately. And I had a situation like that that just happened and I'm glad I did. It worked out perfectly. And I just waited 24 hours and it all solved itself. Mm. I think that we're just trained in our minds that when somebody poses something on you, especially an email, for example, at least for me, it pops in and then I feel like I need to answer right away. That's the beauty of email. You don't. You can sit on it for a little bit and really reflect on what can I control? What can't I control? Is this really that important? You know, ask yourself these questions and sit back. And then usually when you do that, things fall into place. They get solved before you even get a chance to answer it. Yeah. And I'll be curious to see if they address that in this handbook, because that by itself is an interesting practice of just asking, is there any chance this will resolve itself? Exactly. That'll be interesting. Because again, we're going through a journey on this book. And every time we go through a week, it's a new thing that we're learning. And we're learning right along with our members when they join us. And so this is going to be a transformative journey that we're going through here. And my transformation has already begun. <laughs> I know, me too. It's, it's wonderful. The next question the author poses is, did you find it useless? I did not. I found it to be a very useful exercise. Like I personally would like a little notepad, like a post-it notepad that was this, complete control, incomplete control. And I could just file like an incident report <laughs> all day long. Yes. And to your point, it takes practice. I have always been this way and I always felt out of place because I tried to explain this to people without putting a label, like this is a stoic way of doing it. I didn't know that. So I was just trying to explain how I think about things. And so now there's an actual philosophy that has been doing this for a very long time. And it's so nice and refreshing because this is my way of going through it. So useful? Absolutely. Because I can't imagine going through life without this because otherwise I would get very emotional and frustrated most of the time. Is there any way you could tweak your approach to make it easier or more useful in the future? So any feedback on how this might be a better system? Ah, that's a good question, really. There's a link actually in the book for a page. You can download a few cheat sheets on the website of the authors and mm -hmm. use that as a printable so that you can write down information because I don't like writing on my book. Oh. I get very protective about books. Like I don't like writing on them. So I need some place to write and reflect. And so there are printables on their website. And so I downloaded it. And then that's what I used. I just put it on a little pad paper and then just started writing it down. And that was super helpful because the cheat sheet itself is so simple. You just put the day. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then it just says complete control, incomplete control. And what is the event? And so mm -hmm. I just went through that process and I don't think it can be any simpler than that. It was very, very easy to use. I agree. And I do write in books. I love to write in books. Annotations. Yeah. And I freak out because I don't like to mess with the actual book. Like I like to look at it new. And that's why I personally like Kindles because I can highlight and then print all the highlights and reflect on the key elements of what I'm reading without highlighting the actual book. <laughs> so and I buy books specifically to write in them. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Isn't that funny how everybody's different, really? Yeah, very neat. The last thing that we wanted to do is just kind of take a peek ahead. So next week, the focus is on what is completely in your control. So we're going to take this 
down from macro to micro, it looks like, Mm -hmm. and be focused just on what is within our control. So that should be interesting as well. And I'll be looking forward to our discussion next Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern, 8 Mountain. Thanks for joining Andrea and I during week one as we apply the lessons in a handbook for new Stoics, How to Thrive in a World Out of Control by Massimo Pigliucci and Gregory Lopez. We invite you to join our Stoic Sister Society membership community on Patreon as we learn and apply Stoic principles to be our best personally and professionally. Stoic Sister Society members will meet weekly, three times per month on Clubhouse, on Thursdays at 8 a.m. Mountain, 10 a.m. Eastern. We will recap the journal activities on a Zoom call every month, which is open to guests. To register for our next Zoom event, visit our Public Stoic Sister Society Facebook group. We look forward to taking this journey with you.